You're listening to The Dr. Ward Bond Show, the fastest growing natural health, nutrition, and inspiration radio show in the nation. Uplifting stories, powerful messages, and triumph over adversity. The experience of entertainment and encouragement is about to begin. And now your host, Dr. Ward Bond. Today's program is very important and very special. You will hear my last interview with Naomi Judd, who passed away from mental illness by taking her own life. Then we will discuss understanding suicide from risk factors to prevention and how to get help with my guest, George Vernadakis, Senior Editor at Everyday Health. Now my interview with the late Naomi Judd. Well, my guest today hails from the Appalachian foothills of Ashland, Kentucky. She is the mother of the country music duo, The Judds, and they were first discovered in 1983 after landing a spot on The Ralph Emery Show. They made their chart debut by the end of the year with Had a Dream for the Heart, and the two were on their way to a history-making career. And for the rest of the 1980s, each single from The Judds released by RCA went to the Billboard Top 10 with 15 number one hits, and again, what an amazing duo. Well, the Judds embarked on their farewell tour in 1991 after Naomi's diagnosis of hepatitis C forced her to retire from the road. While Naomi focused on her health, beating the disease, writing several New York Times bestselling books, and becoming a very popular motivational speaker. And listen to the list of awards from Naomi and the Judds. Judds. Six-time Grammy winners, nine-time CMAs, eight-time ACM winners, 15 number one hits, and again, without further ado, and I am very honored with my guest today, Ms. Naomi Judd. Hello, Naomi. Well, what a true adventure it is meeting you finally. I appreciate all the good work that you've been doing. Oh, well, thank you so much. Well, I want to kind of jump into your to your brand new book, I was very uh, intrigued, to say the least, because I want to kind of, you know, start off the interview with what made you want to go public with your struggles with depression? I've always been an entertainer, and I was actually going to go on, nobody knows this, I was going to go get my MD, uh, but Winona, at the time, I guess she was about 12, 13, she started singing on me, and I knew that she had her destiny stamped on her forehead. We had to come to Nashville. So I just sort of put aside um, my fantasy about becoming a doctor, came to Nashville uh, for her to get into country music. Um, I was already a registered nurse, so I was working at the area hospital, head nurse in ICU, when we started getting into country music. But um, I have always, ever since I was a child, according to family stories, I've always wanted to help people. I used to do the the funerals in the neighborhood for all the pets, and um, I was one that took everybody's homework to them when they had the mumps um, after after school, but I just consider myself um, a healer, and after the farewell tour, you mentioned the hepatitis C, the Mayo Clinic, by the way, gave me three years to live. How horrible is that? Yeah, when the doctor told me that, it was like he was putting a medical hex on me. He was putting a curse on me, and if I didn't know what I knew about medicine, I might be taking a six-foot dirt nap right now. But anyway, they gave me three years to live. Um, I really began studying the uh, scientific rationale behind the spirit-mind-body connection, but I went into a very deep, dark depression because I missed the fans so desperately. I was used to being on stage Super Bowl, London Palladium, Madison garden, Carnegie Hall and all that, different city every night, all that stimulation, and, and I I was just so, I live on a remote farm, and Dr. Bond, I don't even see people unless I go into town. Our, our farm is that deep in the woods, but I sunk so low with this depression, I began even having a terrible panic attack, panic disorder. I'd be up all night with this panic attack thing, and I just knew that one of the ways that I get myself out of these um, horrible tragedies is by focusing on other people. That's what helped me recover and actually be cured from hepatitis C. So once again, I just stayed focused on reaching out to other people, trying to help them understand um, how they too can emerge with hope and 
spoiler alert here, but I'm doing great now. I figured out certain things that I do every single day to keep myself um, mentally strong. Well, let me let me ask you this because you know you, you were diagnosed with hepatitis C back in 1991, and I'm sure the shock of first getting the diagnosis because back then you know hepatitis C, no one really knew how to effectively treat it like they do today, and then you're giving given the diagnosis of three years to live. And, I mean, was this leading up to or was this the cause of the depression? Or was it, or was the depression missing, you know, the, the touring and interacting with fans and making records? That's a great question. You know, back then, um, hepatitis C was a death sentence. We didn't have any cures. Nobody ever used the word cure. Of course, I'm very happy to announce it today. We have a couple of medications. We've come so far, and we actually can get cures for people, which just thrills my soul. Um, but I think having to retire, and I can remember our last concert. I was the last one to leave the arena, the very last one, and I stood there as my skeleton crew was finishing. My lighting guys literally turned off my spotlight on my side of the stage, and it was a metaphor. Who turned off mm. my light? Who turned off my spotlight? My bus driver brought me home on my tour bus, dropped me off at my farm here. About 2 o'clock in the morning, it was a bitterly cold December night. I remember it, unfortunately, all too well. I had my gowns and a bag over my arm, um, a box with my stuff from the bus on it. I came into my farm, and my husband was out with Winona. He'd gone out to help her start her solo career. I was alone. I could literally hear the talk, the clock ticking in my kitchen, and I just knew that I was in trouble. The phone never rang. I never saw anybody, and that's what I really started my descent. So it was a combination because the hepatitis C forced my retirement. I was so critically ill, I couldn't even pull on my pantyhose. I couldn't put my makeup on, let alone stay on stage for 90 minutes and do a big show jumping off risers. So the hepatitis well, C did forced you, me to be home. Well, did your friends abandon you when you got off the road? Well, like Reba, um, Dolly Parton, all these, and Tammy Wynette was my best friend until she was murdered, but they were my girlfriends. I didn't get to see them a whole lot. We would park our buses side by side when we were touring together. But to tell you the truth, I hadn't cultivated friends here in, um, where I live. And I live in, in Tennessee but an hour south of Nashville. Winona lives over the hill behind me, and Asha lives up the road on a farm next to me. But I didn't, I never took time because I was spending all my life on the road. Um, for instance, I never went to restaurants when I was home because I ate in a restaurant every night on the road. But I didn't, I hadn't cultivated really true girlfriends. So after I came home and had all this time on my hands, I began to develop what I call the Yaya Sisterhood. There was a movie I actually did about 15 years ago called Divine, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Oh, yeah. But, but there's a, it's a story about women who grow up together literally from um, childhood all the way to the, the chronicles then through all the years and the way they stuck together through their friendship. So I had this big ceremony doing the Yaya Sisterhood thing from the movie. And I found about 11 girls that um, have become literally my sisters now. And we are very tightly bonded. So they helped me through the depression because they made me get out of the house. There's a chapter in my book called Potato Salad on the Hood of the Car. Because I would <laughs> promise that I'd be ready to go out and do something or go over to somebody's house and have dinner and watch a movie. And then I wouldn't be able to leave the house. I wouldn't be able to get out of my pajamas. So I'd leave my world-famous potato salad on the hood of my car, and they'd come get it. And I'd hide behind the curtains and watch them until they left. But I got so bad, it's... Uh, well, let it, me ask you this. When did the nightmares start, and why? The nightmares started during the depression thing. I realized that we all heal from the inside out. You know, physically, if we have a cut, the cut has to heal from the deepest part of the cut. It literally heals from the down up, and I had to sort of excavate my past. There were a lot of things that I had never taken the time to pull out into the light of day, 
and acknowledge things that I had never told anybody. Um, one of my therapists asked me what was my first memory, and I said the words for the first time in my life. I said, well, my first memory is three and a half, being sexually molested by Uncle Charlie. And he about fell out of his seat. And then I was 22 years old, living in Hollywood, raising the two kids, one and actually all by myself, didn't even have a car, if you can believe that, in Hollywood. I remember one time <laughs> taking Ashley to the bus, to the, I mean, to the doctor on a bus. She had a 103 temperature, and that was a low point for me. I felt like a terrible mother. But anyway, I was 22, going through a really rough time, and I was beaten and raped by an ex-con on heroin. When he shot up heroin, I was able to escape and go to the sheriff's station with the girls. So... Those are just a few of the things that I actually talk about in the book. While I was going through this period with all these different psychiatrists and going to facilities for a month at a time to help clear out, first of all, like I said, acknowledge my traumas and then mm-hmm. deal with them and figure out what I had learned from them, what I could use. And it really helped me to identify with other people. And one of the things that I did study was all the... So stuff about the brain. The brain is my passion. I study neuroscience and genetics. Wow. But well, I just gave a, br- a brain lecture last night, so uh, you and I yes. need to talk more. Yes. Yeah, so you and I probably have more discussions in that area probably after this interview, but uh, let me ask you this, because you said that you had seen a series of psychiatrists and, and other experts and and trying to you know get through this period of time and but and then now you've led into the fact that uh well you started studying the brain a little bit more now what did that lead you to well i actually began studying um because when i was diagnosed in 1993 and realized well no actually i was diagnosed in about 1990 but at that time they didn't even have a test for hepatitis c they just said i had non-hiv right. but in 1993 when they came out with the hep c um diagnosis test, and I knew what I had, I refused to buy into what the doctors were telling me. And it was horrible because I literally looked at my liver biopsy under the electron microscope. I knew enough from uh, my medical background to be able to recognize that I was in bad shape, according to what that biopsy showed. So I began um, calling people. I began, like Dr. Andrew Weil, is now a close friend. Yes. We've been friends for 20 years. I go to his ranch. He's been here to my farm. Um, Dr. Maimon Oz is coming to the house tomorrow. I've known Maimon Oz, who has the hit show Dr. Oz on TV. We've been friends for about yeah. 20 years. Um, everybody from Deepak Chopra to um, Dr. Candace Pert, a biophysicist who actually passed away last year. But I would befriend them, and I would sit through their lectures, I do their placebo-based double-blind clinical trial studies, and slowly but surely, it helped me stimulate my body's immune system. I was so, I had such a beleaguered immune system, but I understood how to use all these different modalities to stimulate my body's own. And I'm one of the few people from that era who uh, was actually pronounced cured. Yeah, because you were actually one of the first, because I remember when the press release came out to state that you had beat hepatitis C, and which was very uncommon at that time. Nobody. Um, my doctor, Dr. Yeah, nobody. Bruce Bacon. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, no, nobody. Uh, I think the, the last person I heard probably after you uh, was probably uh, Pamela Anderson when uh, she overcome overcame hepatitis C. But you know, yes. let me let me uh, let, let's help help all the listeners with the timeline here because so you go off the road in 1991, and at this time you're dealing with this whole diagnosis of hepatitis C, seeking out you know you're basically going beyond the doctor that tells you that you have three years to live. So to me, you you still have the fight in you, and because you're wanting answers, and uh, so was the depression lingering before the hepatitis C, or did just coming off the road just really compound the whole problem? It started during the hepatitis C. For one thing, anytime you have a serious uh, physical ailment, of course, hepatitis C, like I told you, was a death sentence, 
And they basically said, just go home to the farm and die. You're going to die a long, slow, lingering death. Well, that will throw you into depression right there. But also, being away from Winona and the fans and getting to sing and communicate with everybody. Um, and I loved waking up every day in a completely different environment, a new city every day. That I mean, you either like it, like I did, or you're on a plane home the next day. It's really uh, a pretty grueling lifestyle, but I just took to it. So I was missing all that. I was missing the traveling. I was missing the whole music environment. I missed the smiling faces of all the dear fans who had changed my life. But I was, in the beginning, so critically ill, I couldn't get out of bed. It was a big deal to get up, brush my teeth, and change my nightgown. But slowly and surely, um, I would use the telephone. I would call Dr. Naomi Rachel Remen, who at that time was one of the chiefs of staff at Stanford. Uh, we became close friends. I would begin calling these doctors, and slowly but surely, of course, I read every book that um, they'd written, I would go, like Dr. Bruce Bacon, who became a, a liver doctor, my specialist, is at the University of um, St. Louis. He's head of hepatology, which, of course, means study of the liver. Uh, I would go up and hang out with him, and he's the one that put me back on the new version of interferon. Nobody had been paying attention. Uh, I would go to doctors and they'd say, hey, I want you to do my benefit next week. And people don't realize how badly celebrities are treated by the medical profession. It's like they have stars really? in their eyes. They don't see us as real people. Wow. So let me ask you this because of, uh, now did the treatment of the hepatitis C, did the treatment alone, did it aggravate the depression? Because if you're on the road, you have to have energy for the road. You, you've got to be, you know, basically pumped up, ready to go, walk out on stage and do the show. So you come home off the bus. Did the fatigue and the sickness, was it more of just uh, from the treatment or more it from just both. coming off the road and for both? Oh, absolutely. Hepatitis C not only affects the liver, but it affects the brain and any of the medications, like interferon, I can't remember the statistic now because it's been a while, but any time a person was on interferon, the vast majority of them would have to drop out, even though interferon was the only game in town to That's do any right. effect on their hepatitis C. They wouldn't be able to stand the hideous side effects. You feel like you have the world's worst case of the flu. Interferon is a naturally occurring substance in the human body. It interferes, hence the name yeah, it interferes with the virus's ability to reproduce. That's all it does. It's like putting a blanket on a fire, a smoldering fire. It just tries to keep the uh, infection down, but it never really cures it. So you have the, anybody who has had a chronic illness or a chronic injury even gets depressed because they're sidelined. They can't get out of bed. They have to stay on the couch. They can't go to work. They lose touch with their family and their friends. So there's the social aspect, but the physiological, the actual physical reality of having hepatitis C is that it causes major depression to the brain chemicals in the brain. And I literally went to Shearing Plow, who made um, the best interferon at the time. I went to one of their meetings and spoke, and I said, you guys have got to figure this out. People will not stay on your drug. I was trying to talk to him because... I knew what they wanted with his money. I said, you're losing oh, yeah. money. They can't stay on your version of interferon. The side effects are too bad. You've got to figure out, tell your scientific panel to figure out how to buffer these hideous side effects so they can stay on the drug. Then they'll get better and you'll get more money. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Now, let me ask you this question, because when did your addiction to clonopin actually start and how did you get off of it? I was on so many medications. Uh, I had a psychiatrist here in Nashville who really just, uh, I felt like a science experiment. He would put me on uh, an antidepressant, and a couple of weeks later, he, it wasn't working. So he would switch me off. Um, I was on just about every single antidepressant um, that was made at that time. And I began having the panic disorder. Uh, people that have never had a panic attack have no clue what the heck I'm talking about, but it's sheer terror, and you think you're dying. It would start at night, 
and I think it started at night because that was usually the time that I would be going on stage. And then right. I would go to bed till two or three in the morning because after the show, you've got meet and greets with the record label people, the radio people, the fan winners. Um, but anyway, at night, I would just become hysterical with terror. So this doctor started giving me clonopin. There are four benzodiazepines. They're called benzos, four benzos. And it's Valium, clonopin, Xanax, and what's the fourth one? Valium, clonopin. Oh, clonopin. Xanax. And but anyway, benzos are highly addictive. And I had no idea. And I've never even been drunk in my life. I've, done, I've never done drugs. Um, but he got me addicted to clonopin. And I went into the Vanderbilt Hospital here in Nashville, Tennessee, and got phenobarbital, which is a very dangerous, seldom Yes, used it's very dangerous. Drug. You know, they had a nurse stayed with me for the first 24 hours checking my blood pressure every 15 minutes. So phenobarbital is so dangerous. But um, there was no way that Naomi Joe was going to get addicted to anything. So I was Well, how did you figure out that you were body. addicted to it? My husband started noticing. Um, Again, I, I was given it by a doctor, which is terrible. But it's sure. just like the opioid crisis right now. These doctors are over-prescribing opioids. We have an epidemic in our country. I'm sure you're keenly aware of that. Oh, I'm very aware of it. Yeah, a lot of them are ended up being pill mills. Yes. And they're just writing out prescriptions for no reason at all. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I was when I gave a lecture last night talking about brain nutrition and on the subject of antidepressants, that a lot of people need to focus on their gut health. And by improving gut health, you're also going to improve the way your body produces neurotransmitters so that the brain can actually use them effectively. That's why I take uh, probiotics, seven strains, every day. There, there you go. Well, there, you know, that's the way we need to do it. And a lot of people, I think, even... I know doctors seem to ignore it because I've talked to a lot of doctors and researchers, and I know you have too. And and I have got to say this, Naomi, I'm very impressed because of the fact that you know I knew you were an RN, and uh, I'm, I'm surprised. I was really surprised that you had uh, you know were actually going to go after uh, to be an MD and then stardom hit. But uh, let me ask you this question, because I know that uh, we're almost uh, towards the end of the show. But uh, through overcoming depression, uh, when did the light bulb finally come on? I'm out of the darkness now. But once you have depression, it's a lifelong situation. One of the interesting uh, quotes that someone told me was, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes that said, one way to live a long life is to acquire a chronic illness, so you have to start taking better care of yourself. So when I realized I had depression, I have the genetic uh, predisposition to depression. My whole family um, is just riddled with major depression, panic disorder. That's why I study epigenetics, by the way. Uh, I just got back from the Libra Brain Institute up in Baltimore, Maryland. It's on the campus of Johns Hopkins. Um, and my best girlfriend's a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist, Dr. Mona Lisa. Stoltz, who teaches me about brain plasticity, and Dr. Francis Collins, who's director of the NIH now, is a dear family friend. Um, he actually came to spend his week's vacation with me and taught me about genetics. So even though I have this genetic predisposition to depression, even though I had hepatitis C, which caused me to be physically as well as emotionally depressed, now I have figured out all these ways to keep myself emotionally strong, to keep myself balanced. I'm also bipolar, so I've learned how to take the proper nutrition. Um, I don't like exercise, but I walk around my big yard every night. I sleep better. We live in a, a gorgeous valley, so uh, that's real good for me. But in my book, I know we don't have the time, in my book, I literally list all the things that I found out the hard way, what I went through, so that I can say to somebody else, if someone listening to our voices right now is one of the 40 million Americans that have depression. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you need to pick up the book. I know that Naomi Judd's book, River of Time, uh, is available in paperback December the 5th. And again, like she has just stated, 
her book will offer in, will and does offer encouragement to the 40 million Americans who suffer from depression and anxiety. So by listening to this interview today, you understand that depression is a very broad condition. People have depression from life experiences and, and Naomi, you know, some of your life experiences are in my mind horrific, but, uh, you know, I, I believe the hand of God is upon you with his healing hand. And I believe that the things that you have learned and that you that you are now sharing with the public, you're you're going to be changing millions of lives. And even though we don't always understand why we go through some things, but, you know, the Lord always tells us our test becomes our testimony. And I believe this is one of those times. So I want to wow. thank you so much for coming onto the show. If I could share this quick verse with you, because it was my oh, daily, please it was my do. daily reading this, this morning. It was Isaiah 26, 3, which said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. So I wish everybody listening to us right now healing of the mind, the body, and the spirit. Thank you, Naomi. A breakthrough in pain relief. Curamed Acute Pain Relief from Terry Naturally is an easy-to-swallow soft gel with results you can feel with clinically proven technology. Curamed Acute Pain Relief is a triple-action pain formula with the most clinically studied bioavailable curcumin in the world. Get Curamed Acute Pain Relief at your local health food store or terrynaturallyvitamins.com. Occasional muscle pain due to exercise or overuse. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Well, my guest today is George Vernadakis, the senior editor at the leading digital health and wellness company, Everyday Health. He oversees the Everyday Health newsroom and is responsible for coverage of several health conditions, including infectious diseases, asthma, allergies, and psoriatic diseases. He joined Everyday Health to launch the Health Matters with Dr. Sanjay Gupta's website and newsletter. And George has more than two decades of editorial experience at award-winning publications and websites such as Advertising Age, Variety, Spy Magazine, and Weight Watchers. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the show today, George Vernadakis. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I, George, I am very interested in this amazing, this very important subject on suicide and suicide uh, prevention. Why was it so important to you to run this type of piece? Well, when you look at the numbers, it's, it's clear that suicide is a public health crisis in this country. Uh, we may not always think of it that way or, or treat it that way, but uh, the reality is it is. Um, it's one of the 10 leading causes of death among Americans. And uh, the most frightening part is that those numbers keep climbing. Uh, in fact, according to another report that was just published, more Americans die from self-injury deaths, which include suicide and overdoses, than from diabetes. Oh, so everyday yes. health, of course, it, it's staggering. And uh, uh, we at Everyday Health have covered suicide many times in the past as part of our overall coverage of mental health related issues. But then came the events of this past June. Uh, we had two prominent public figures uh, die by suicide just literally days apart. Um, as I'm sure you recall, fashion designer Kate Spade uh, and the, the celebrity chef journalist Anthony Bourdain um, both died by suicide in the same week. Uh, Coincidentally, that same week, the, the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, released a pretty startling report on suicide rates in the United States. And the CDC reported that suicide rates rose in nearly every state uh, between the years 1999 and 2016. And half of all states saw suicides increase by more than 30%. Oh, my. So, it was a combination of what was in the news and, and this latest data that we saw from the CDC um, that we decided we, we should do an expanded report on understanding suicide, uh, not just to look at the news and the numbers at a, a macro level, but hopefully to help people spot the signs that someone may need help, um, how you should and should not uh, intervene 
and uh, and most importantly, what resources are available out there? Because the important thing is, uh, we have to remember that suicide is preventable, um, and and hopefully we help provide information to uh, facilitate people uh, getting out there and helping themselves and helping others. Well, let me ask you this: Why do you think suicide rates are increasing in general, and yet the conversation is still fairly muted? Yeah, well, as to why the rates are rising, um, there really is no easy answer. Um, as the experts uh, that we spoke to said, uh, suicide is complex. It's it's rarely caused by any single factor. <clears throat> Certainly, mental health conditions raise the risk for suicide. Uh, we know that depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, they're all associated with an elevated risk for suicidal behavior, but that in no way tells the whole story. In fact, according to the CDC data, more than half of the people who died by suicide did not have a known mental health condition. So many, many factors and combinations of factors contribute to suicide risk. It's things like financial troubles, relationship problems, uh, illness, uh, substance abuse, uh, people with substance abuse uh, disorders are about six times more likely to die by suicide. And as we all know, we are facing an opioid epidemic in this country. And uh, and then there are other, some other interesting and very important um, factors that are contributing to these numbers. There's the social media question. Uh, there have been several studies uh, that suggest uh, there is a link or maybe a link between the popularity of social media and a rise in suicide rates, uh, particularly among teens. Young people who are heavy users of social media often report uh, feeling isolated, lonely, or or depressed. And uh, according to data from the National Center for Health Statistics, the suicide rate among girls between the ages of 15 and 19 doubled just between 2007 and 2015. Uh, a period of time that correlates with a surge in the popularity of social media. Well, do you feel, George, that that has to do with uh, anywhere from bullying to body shaming to a lot of girls maybe not feeling that they're capable of, you know, uh, looking like one of the Kardashians, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the list goes on. I mean, social media today to me is becoming, well, it's a little dangerous and, and I, I've noticed the same thing you did, you know, the increase in suicide among teens related to social media. And, I, and it's hard to determine what do we do about that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, not not to say that there isn't a, a great deal that's good about social media, but the reality is that uh, the irony is that at the same time that it, it facilitates connections, um, it also fosters for a lot of people these feelings of, of isolation um, some of it has to do with shaming, which you mentioned. Um, there is uh, offering people a window on other people's lives, or at least the way other people represent their lives, uh, may make people feel like theirs, theirs doesn't measure up. Uh, and cyberbullying is a is a, a huge part of the problem. Um, as a, a follow up, in fact, to the report that we did on understanding suicide, everyday health wanted to put a human face on on the um on this issue and we interviewed and profiled suicide survivors um and by that I include people who had survived an attempted suicide and and loss survivors people who had lost a loved one to suicide and and as part of that uh piece we spoke to a mother whose uh 12-year-old daughter 12 years old took uh her own life uh after being relentlessly bullied at school and on social media. Uh, And uh, it's frightening to think that according to some studies, nearly 43% or more of young people say they have been bullied at least once online. So the cyberbullying is also a a huge, huge element, particularly as it concerns young people. Yeah, it's amazing that, you know, I call myself, you know, old school because I grew up in a time of the seventies. You know, I, I graduated high school in 1981. So times back then we didn't have personal computers. There were no such thing as smartphones. We didn't have social media. If you wanted to be social, 
you talked face to face. If somebody bullied you or you wanted to take care of a problem, you'd say, meet me out by the oak tree after school and we're going to take care of this. Uh, Mm -hmm. Today, you know, people hide behind their Twitter avatar, their their Facebook picture, and they, they build a life that is not even real. But then with teenagers and I feel I feel for them because, you know, everybody wants to be accepted into this world. And, you know, in my time, you know, it was always saying that, oh, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And in a way, that same mentality is happening today, but with social media. And you have a lot of people who go on social media to appear that they're successful. They got it going on. And and then the other half or more is like, you know, gee, how did that person get to be so well off, even though they could be faking the whole thing? But, you know, Absolutely. like you said, over 50 percent of the suicides were not even linked to. To mental illness, and that is something we really need to to dive into as a society to get those numbers to go down. So, what Absolutely. do we do? Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> to your to the other part of your question about the conversation and and why it's so muted. I mean, I think that that's uh, that's an important thing to to at least try to understand if if the, the considering the magnitude of the problem why aren't we hearing more why aren't we doing more and um you know i think a lot of it has to do uh with stigma people who are struggling and and having uh suicidal thoughts may suffer in silence uh because they are afraid of being rejected or uh even ridiculed if they open up to others and that that stigma extends to people who lost loved ones to suicide. Uh, The mother uh, that I mentioned earlier that we spoke to whose daughter killed herself said that she herself felt judged as if uh, people were wondering what she did or didn't do that may have contributed to her daughter's suicide. Um, And then talking about suicide is, is in of itself is hard because there are so, so many factors involved when, when someone attempts or completes suicide, we tend to we tend to look for an easy explanation, but it's much more complicated than that. It um, it requires that uh, that we all, as as individuals, as communities, uh, at a government level, um, that we move on a lot of fronts and tackle uh, everything from health insurance coverage and access to health uh, to how best to provide needed financial and uh, emotional support. Uh, for us at Everyday Health, we felt that the, one of the major things we could contribute and one of the first steps is to try to give our readers at a, at a personal individual level information and, uh, and tools that they could use, uh, hopefully to, to help identify uh, problems either in themselves or in others and, and then uh, empower them to uh, figure out what they could do as individuals. Well, let me ask you this, because for those people that you interviewed that survived a suicide attempt, what did they say? Did they give any clues as to what signs that we can actually maybe see or take notice of in people that uh, we may not think would commit suicide, but maybe they're showing signs that we need to be aware of? Well, in the case of this uh, this uh, woman whose twelve year old daughter uh, killed herself, she um, she said that she she had no idea that uh, that uh, what she saw in the way of her uh, daughter's uh, behavior seemed perfectly norm- normal for a young teen. Um, and uh, while she was somewhat aware that there were some students at her school that were bothering her. She didn't at the time um, uh, realize um, how relentlessly her daughter was being bullied. Um, uh, Her daughter also, interestingly, had friends. Uh, And this is something that when we did a report earlier on loneliness, you know, it's sort of the the difference between being lonely and isolated. You may not, you can be lonely in a crowded room. and, um, and, and, And this young girl was apparently an avid gymnast and and had social connections through her interests. On the other hand, apparently she had difficulties making new friends at her school because of this this bullying that was going on, this ridiculing. Um, 
all of that said, there are um, there are so-called red flags uh, for suicidal behavior. They're not always obvious. They're not always all there, uh, but there there are signs uh, to look for uh, that may indicate suicidal thoughts or or what we call ideation. Um, these may include things like um, if a person expresses feelings of hopelessness, uh, feelings of isolation. Um, or uh, of being a burden to others, uh, extreme mood swings, um, uh, something as, as basic as changes in their sleep patterns, um, and certainly any uh, substance abuse uh, or increases in, in substance abuse. These are all um, common red flags, but again, they may be subtle uh, and they may not all occur at the same time. Uh, so it, it's a it's a it's a challenge, and 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 that's why it's so important to stay to to stay close to the people that you care about, uh, to keep the communication open, um, and to uh, and to be willing to ask direct questions. Because as one expert said, uh, you know, people don't commit suicide because you ask them about it. Um, they uh, asking direct questions uh, actually uh, frees them up. To uh, hopefully uh, address some of the the troubles that the, that they're enduring. You know, I want to kind of go back to the first question because it's it's so important. And, and with media today, you know, we, we all seem to scan through articles on our smartphones or iPad, or if we're on the computer, we have about a six second attention span. And when it comes to suicide. The conversation, it doesn't matter if it was Kate Spade or Anthony Bourdain or our others out there. You know, we, we go through a, a day of shock. We hear about it on the news for about a week and then it disappears and nobody ever mentions it again and they just wait for the next one. So how can we get this conversation to go from being muted to being in the forefront to realize that this is a national problem. Right. Well, I think, uh, you know, education uh, and raising awareness are key uh, to the extent that uh, we at Everyday Health and other organizations can do that. Um, that's that's the um, really the, the first and fundamental step. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and, um, and, and that fuels the... Uh, the stigma and shame that we touched on earlier. Um, I think the more we can convey um, the magnitude of the problem to people, um, you know, the sort of statistics that stood out uh, when we were doing the, the research. I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the CDC data showed a 30% rise over the past two decades. Um, the fact that tens of thousands of Americans die by suicide every year is staggering. Uh, in 2016 alone, uh, nearly 45,000 lives were lost to suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, we touched on young people. I mean, the, the the numbers show that suicide is the second leading cause of death for people uh, between the ages of 15 and 24, uh, and third leading cause of death in children as young as 10 to 14. Oh um, I think the more that uh, that we can communicate uh, the uh, these kinds of numbers uh, and 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 uh, get people to understand again at an individual level but also community level the the magnitude of the problem. Um, hopefully, what we in essence are doing is is recruiting them and their services to to watch out. And, and for people who who may be uh, in in a crisis, and 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 help intervene. Uh, the uh, other statistic uh, that I wanted to mention concerns gender. Uh, suicide uh, typically is more common among men. The majority of deaths by suicide are among men, but the numbers are also now rising more and more among women. And female suicide rates were significantly higher. Uh, in 2016 as compared to 2000. Uh, it's not clear what's driving the numbers. There's been some research done that suggests it has to do with uh, increased stress at work and at home uh, for women. Um, 
but uh, and uh, one survey found that uh, nearly half of the women uh, surveyed said that their stress had increased significantly over the past five years. But but it's not it, it's still not clear what's driving the numbers. But the thing is that um, the gender gap, if you will, is uh, in suicide rates is also narrowing. Um, so these are all very, uh, very uh, disconcerting, worrying, uh, important things that I think need to be conveyed, along with the fact that it is not, strictly speaking, a mental health condition issue, uh, not when uh, roughly half of the people who died by suicide had no known mental health condition. I think these are all the kinds of things that people need to know um, and hopefully will help them uh, help uh, others. Well, let me ask you this. Everyday Health is a great resource for so much information. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to look up Everyday Health and, and check them out. Uh, but, George, what is your mission behind this story and others like it? Well, Everyday Health general mission, if you will, is uh, to deliver trusted, timely health uh, and medical information. And uh, the goal there is to help people live their healthiest, fullest lives. Uh, we want we want our readers to understand what's going on in terms of health trends and medical advances. Uh, we want them to feel like they're hearing all the important conversations that are happening in the health space, but we also want our readers to feel empowered. Uh, we want to we want them to come away with practical insights and and tools that they can apply in in real life. So, for example, last fall, we surveyed 3,000 women and we asked what wellness meant to them. We we asked them to define and rate their personal wellness based on uh, factors like physical, emotional, even financial health. Uh, and then we took that data to top experts on women's health to better understand what was standing in the way of women's health and happiness. And most importantly, what they can do about it, basic things like uh, achieving a healthier body image, uh, managing their stress, uh, getting a better night's sleep, uh, coping with illness. Um, in the case of our suicide coverage, we wanted to define the problem uh, to convey its magnitude, but we also wanted to give readers basic information and access to resources that they could use to help them understand what are the risk factors, what are the signs that someone may need help, and, and where they could turn to get that help, um, and uh, and hopefully uh, we achieve that. Well, the thing that I'm impressed with, George, is that you you've really brought an article out that is covering suicide in a way that a lot of us may have not uh, realized. You know, if if over fifty percent of those committing suicide have no known mental illness, um, do you know of any type of stats of those 50% that may have been on any type of uh, mind-altering medication that could have, you know, had side effects that could have led to those types mm -hmm. of decisions? It's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and, 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 and it's a, a very gray area when we get into uh, the question of, of uh, medication and drug use. Uh, and substance abuse disorders. In fact, um, the report that I mentioned earlier that just came out about self-injury uh, deaths outpacing uh, diabetes uh, for the first time, uh, part of that report's point, those researchers' point, is that they feel that suicide um, and uh, overdoses, um, and, which include drug and also alcohol abuse, uh, should all be included together under this term self-injury uh, mortality. Um, uh, the implication there being that the, the, the problem uh, is even greater uh, than we realize. Um, however, the reality is that uh, 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 a significant percentage of, of deaths associated with uh, uh, overdoses uh, are, are considered accidental uh, and not suicidal. So um, to your question, I don't have a specific statistic in part because that's part of the problem, uh, the difficulty in distinguishing between um, accidental uh, and intentional uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, but there is definitely a call uh, in the medical community to consider 
uh, treating uh, these overdoses and substance abuse uh, deaths uh, alongside with suicides as a, a total number for, for self-injury mortality. Well, yeah, I understand the whole self-injury thing, um, but in a way, I almost think they should kind of keep them a little bit separate because, you know, an accident is an accident and suicide mm-hmm. is a choice. And yeah. um, for medical researchers in general, I think it would help them to keep those numbers separated so they can really fine tune on certain areas. Because uh, recently I had done a a piece for the local morning show here on CBS in Houston on depression and suicide. And the focus was on the medications. And mm-hmm. it was shocking to see that nearly 80 million Americans are taking at least one uh, psychiatric drug. Uh, 41 million people take at least one antidepressant. 7.5 million children between the ages of 6 and 17 take one antidepressant. And more than a million children under the age of 5 could be taking an antidepressant or an ADHD medication. And these things, you know, have the tendency to have side effects that could lead to suicidal thoughts and tendencies. Mm-hmm. And, I oh, yeah. think and it's you... even something as basic as flu medication. That are, there have been reports in terms of side effects um, uh, of children uh, displaying depressive and suicidal behaviors uh, from just taking uh, flu medication. That is that is shocking, and that is extremely scary. Now, let me ask you this, George, because at Everyday Health, what are some of the other big launches that you have in the pipeline? Well, needless to say, we're going to continue to cover this issue closely, and um, as part of our overall mental health coverage this this year, we've created, uh, we've launched expanded reports on anxiety and bipolar disorder, uh, and we're planning a new report on major depressive disorder uh, later this year. Um, something. Uh, we're working on now and, and very excited about uh, is a report on stress. Uh, when we conducted the survey for our report on women's wellness, which I, I mentioned earlier, we found that stress was one of the top challenges uh, to wellness. So we decided to really dig deep into the subject of stress. With a panel of experts, we're going to explore what factors cause stress, what stress actually does to our bodies. Um, what techniques we can use to manage it, and uh, and even how we can put stress to work for us. So we've collected all the data from uh, a survey that we conducted, and we're in the process of compiling an extensive package uh, that should start rolling out uh, in mid to late September. So we're very excited about that, and I think our, our readers will be too. Well, how can all of my listeners uh, find Everyday Health? The easiest way would be um, everydayhealth.com, everydayhealth, one word, dot com. Uh, and uh, that's our homepage. And, uh, uh, in fact, the women's wellness study that I mentioned uh, is, is featured on that on that homepage. Uh, there's also site search available uh, once you're there. So if you're interested in reading more about suicide and the understanding suicide uh, uh, piece we talked about, uh, you can do a site search uh, for understanding suicide uh, to find it. Now, um, is, does Everyday Health also have a, a newsletter that we can subscribe to? Yes. Once you're on the website, um, you can uh, find, uh, if you scroll down uh, towards uh, the bottom of the page, the footer, one of the links will uh, take you to a sign-up page. Uh, we have uh, a wide range of newsletters from Broad Daily Healthy Living newsletters to more targeted specific uh, newsletters uh, on, for instance, asthma and allergies or uh, living with psoriasis and living with um, many different conditions. So you can uh, pick and choose from the many newsletters available there. Oh, fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, please go to everydayhealth.com, sign up. This is a, a site that to me really pinpoints the type of health information we truly, truly need in our lives. And, and, you know, because, you know, there's, there's power uh, when we gain knowledge 
And I encourage everyone to gain knowledge about their health. Start gaining knowledge about other type of conditions. Maybe you're not suffering with that condition, but maybe you know someone who is, and you could be that lifeline to help that person. You know, George uh, Vernon Dacus and I have been discussing the subject of suicide in this episode. For those, any of you out there, you're listening to this episode right now. Maybe you're driving down the freeway, you're going to work, and you're having thoughts that you shouldn't be having. Suicide is a choice, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm asking you, don't make that choice. Choose to live. There are people out there that can help you. Find the suicide prevention in your area. Talk to somebody. Communication is key. As George describes social media, you know, in in today's time, it's not really social. It can cause people to be isolated, and you can even be lonely in a crowded room. But this show is called Life Changing Wellness for a reason, and we believe that this episode is life changing to you right now. So just realize there is someone out there today that cares about you. And just remember that I care about you. I want you to live. So seek help. There's always somebody there who's willing to reach out to help you lead a better life. George, thank you so much for for being on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Are you stressed, full of anxiety? Your mind never seems to be calm or at peace? These are all caused by elevated cortisol levels. Cortisol is the hormone that's responsible for stress and is one of the few that increases with age. It's believed that high cortisol levels lead to aging and over time, cortisol can damage your brain, muscles, bones, skin, and even your immune system. Gerovital H3 is used for lowering stress by reducing cortisol. Call Primrose Leaf today for Gerovital H3, the real GH3. Call 844-376-0007. That's our show for this week. Be sure to visit drwardbond.com for more of our daily television show, weekly radio show, and podcast. We'll be back next week. The Dr. Ward Bond Show is sponsored by the Whitfield Media Group.